Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for all that you have shown us through these first eight chapters of the Epistle to the Romans, the majesty of your grace. I just ask that you would take and just filter out all of the foolishness and the ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and we have come to chapter 9. 9 and 10 are our famous chapters for the subject of election. And I've been looking at these passages here, the first beginning introduction into Romans 9. I've been studying it, thinking about it, meditating on it, praying over it. Uh, just about everywhere I go, I'm thinking about it. I've had some time to really look at the beginning few verses here, and so you might consider this a introductory video into chapter 9. Now, many surprising things have uh, been, I believe we can draw out from the text uh, some amazing truth here. I know some of you have looked forward to this chapter for a long time. The first thing that I want to direct your attention to is the fact that this chapter is not broken up by a chapter division. There actually were no chapter divisions in the original text, and I think that's worthy of note. Another fact that's worthy of note is, is that chapters 1 through 8, we saw the absolute supreme sovereignty of our God. If you've been following these videos, you've seen an enormous amount of truth based on the absolute sovereignty of God and, and the finished work of Christ as it applies to the Christian life. And now we come to Romans 9, and I don't see why we would expect it to be any different. I don't expect, uh, we shouldn't expect to see the mind of the Holy Spirit to change. So it shouldn't shock the reader as if election here is something new. That's the first thing I want to bring to your attention. Yeah, I think that the context here, the chapter, the, even the first few beginning verses will bear that out. So there were there was no chapter division in the original manuscripts. Uh, the same is, is actually seen in Peter's denial of, of Jesus, which is followed by, let not your heart be troubled, John 14. So, that's, so we, we see a similar situation there. You see that a lot when you cross over from one chapter to another so uh, there's no break there's no break I don't believe in the in the mind or the thought of the Holy Spirit through Paul as he's making that transition from eight to nine nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. No chapter division. Text goes on to say that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ on behalf of my brethren my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. I'm convinced that what we're seeing as we make this crossover from chapter 8 to 9 we obviously, we saw that we cannot be separated from God in 8. 
we'll see in 9 that Israel has not been separated from God. So nothing can separate us in 8, yet Paul's next thought is that, and this is quite remarkable, is that he is willing to be separated for his people in 9. Now, I, I myself have brushed over that passage for years, and, and I don't believe I've ever really fully grasped the import of just what Paul is saying or, or, or why he would say such a thing as he did. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, remember this is not Paul's logic, but the Holy Spirit that is doing the, the, the speaking to us here, the Holy Spirit through Paul, just like Moses, takes on the mind and the heart of Christ for his people Israel. So what happened to Israel in chapter 9? What we're going to find out is it was not separated from the love of God, just as we were not separated from the love of God. So that's uh, something I want to highlight here as we go into this. Israel itself is a physical illustration of spiritual truth election it's not unusual uh, we have many illustrations Christ is the way the rock the water the lamb is Christ the serpent is Satan etc etc so God is not finished with Israel not cast away what's interesting is if you you turn to Exodus chapter 32 what we see there is we see Israel in the flesh turning away from God and we see Israel in the spirit in the concern of Moses on the mount his concern for his people and we have that constant conflict between flesh and spirit in the Word of God in other words we just looked at that that conflict between the old man and new man the flesh and the spirit in chapter 7 and we need to remind ourselves that that same conflict existed in in the lives of God's people Israel we just saw the conflict in Romans 7 it was the same in the case of of Israel you'll notice that in Exodus 32 we have Moses who is a beautiful type of Christ in the Old Testament offering himself in the place of the nation. Does that sound familiar? We just, we're just looking at Paul's, and I keep saying Paul, and I know it's Paul, and I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from Paul, but the Holy Spirit is the author here. The heart of God, the mind of God, the Holy Spirit. Paul just merely held the pen. I'm not trying to take away from Paul having the feelings that he did or writing what he did. But he did so through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Exodus 32, 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive the, their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Does that, does that sound familiar? It's just like what we're reading here in Paul in, in chapter 9. Where he says, For I, I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Folks, what I am seeing here in the text is the heart of God toward Israel as it regards redemption through Jesus Christ whom they rejected. And again, not to minimize the heart of Moses or Paul, but the Holy Spirit wrote what we are reading through Paul. Why did Paul why would he wish himself for curse? That's the question I had to ask myself. I'm, I'm convinced Paul is being led to do what Moses desired to do, which neither one of them could do, who was a type of Christ who actually did it. Let me say that again. Paul is being led to do what Moses desired to do, who was a type of Christ, Christ who actually did it. And we actually see that in the, in the grammar, believe it or not, that comes out forcefully in the grammar. God said to Moses, I will make of you a great race. I will abrogate my promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said to Moses, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them 
and I will make of thee a great nation. This is what God told Moses as he come down off the mount and Israel was in rebellion. Therefore, Paul is being led to do what Moses desired to do in Exodus 32, who was a type of Christ who actually did it. And the word wish is an imperfect, it's in the imperfect tense. The imperfect always implies an incompleted past action. It can't be done. Therefore, Paul is saying, basically what he's saying is, if I could do it, I would, but I can't. And that's quite remarkable because, well, of course he can. Only Christ could. But we still see the mind and heart of the Holy Spirit toward his people who had rejected him, whom he had set aside. Are you following this? So we can see in the imperfect, in the grammar itself, a confirmation that not only Christ could, that not only was he the only one who could, but much, much more. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. That's and, and the word for there, as I've pointed out in past videos, is the word who pair, which means on behalf of accursed from Christ on behalf of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who are Israelites? Well, they're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When they're called Israelites, they are descendants of Jacob. And we'll see that later on in the chapter. And Abraham could not have a child, so he, he had a child of promise. And ye, brethren, are children of promise as Isaac was. Folks, that is a marvelous spiritual truth. We are children of promise. The message is, is crystal clear. There is not anything the flesh could do. And then now we see Rebecca. God put two children in her womb, and if and if you know what happens next, well, you know how election fits into this. Twins, folks, twins. One he elected, one he did not. Anyone that is of the Arminian persuasion can't read the ninth chapter and be honest with the text. Can't do it. It just can't be done. If no created thing, and this is what we saw before we got into the chapter, can separate us from the love of God, what do we do with Israel? Well, we don't have to do anything with Israel. Israel is in the sovereign plan and program of God. God is doing what God designed. Elect nation and elect you and me. Do you see the consistency here with God? These are Israelites. Why is Israel so important? The text tells us, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Man, that's quite a privilege. None of those things were true of any other nation. The Tower of Babel, uh, the Lord confounded the languages and people were spread throughout the whole earth and, and God chose Abraham alone so that he had a vehicle for the coming of Christ. He chose Israel so that he had a, a plot of ground to plant a cross not a very big plot of ground. He didn't need, didn't need to be. They are Israelites. That very beginning of the fourth verse is enormously important. They are Israelites. They are children of promise. God made a covenant with Abraham. He renewed it with Isaac. He renewed it with Jacob. They are people whom God chose, and the same is true of us. This is not something new. Election isn't something new that, that should surprise Christians at all. 
Christians hate the idea, folks, of God electing them when he elected an entire nation for himself, which, strangely, they don't seem to have much of a problem with. Well, do you believe uh, God chose Israel? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely do. Well, do you believe God chose you? No. No, I, I, no sorry. Now you're, now you're teaching that election stuff, and, you know, on and on and on it goes. Oh, but that's Israel, Steve. That has nothing to do with us. Well, I, I beg to differ. A nation that cannot be separated from the love of, of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, just as nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. No other nation had what Israel had. No other idol or temple or, or worship or religious process had the Shekinah glory that Israel had that settled on the tabernacle. That so affected the face of Moses, he had to put a veil over it so that the, the children of Israel wouldn't watch it fade. Israel is the physical illustration of the certainty of those covenants God made with her, just as Christ is the physical illustration of the covenant He made with us, the new covenant. The giving of the law. No other nation had that. You have two possibilities. You can decide what God ought to be like and, and design Him in your own mind, and that's what many people do. Or you can know the God of this book. The only thing that you can know about God is revealed in the Word of God. And God gave His law to reveal to, to us to highlight the righteousness of God. And He gave it through Israel. He never gave it to the church at all. And that law is still the basis for our jurisprudence today. And then the promises. The promises. I recognize those promises are important to us, but they came through Israel, as the text says, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Whose are the fathers? Oh, and here is the climax. This is why God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who, as concerning flesh, the Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen, and we could spend a lot of time there on that verse. Whose are the fathers? Well, fathers of what? The process through which Christ came. We've got the genealogies in Matthew and Luke. Who as concerning the flesh, the Christ came, the Messiah. I don't know of any verse more clear in the Greek than the fifth verse of Romans chapter 9. Yet translation after translation tries to rob that verse of its simple, straightforward statement that Christ is God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh. We, we see His fleshly nature as well as His deity, His humanity as well as His deity, who is over all, God blessed forever. There is no period either after the word came in the text. The Christ is in this passage called God who is over all. Modern Christianity gives man far more power than he has. We spend a lot of time talking about how we are spiritually dead and have to be quickened to life first. Romans 9 through 10 chapters 9 and 10 are, are the strongest statement, this, in my opinion, of the majesty, the sovereignty, the glory, and the purpose of God any place in the Word of God. We see in this chapter that God has not set His people aside. He'll bring them back into a state of belief. He will deliver His people. He hasn't abandoned His people. He loves His people. He, and He will do so based on promise the promises that He made to them and the finished work of Christ, through the finished work of Christ. He'll do so because, why? Because He chose them. He will do so because they are His people. 
his people. But it is not only Israel here, folks, that, that has this blessed hope. We have that blessed hope as well. God is not dealing with Israel any different than he is with us, us as far as, as redemption goes. We are his people. We will see in verse 16, So then it is not of him that willeth, not of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. That is a wonderful, wonderful truth, folks. It's not a truth to be afraid of. It's not a, a truth to argue against. It's not a truth to debate uh, against, to try to change, to try to make it say something other than what it said. It's not a truth to, to be offended at. It's not a truth to, to d divide over. It is a precious truth. God, that God chose us is a precious, precious truth. Because if He had not, we would have never chosen Him. So, to summarize, chapters 1 through 8 revealed God's sovereignty in, a, in an enormous way. If you, if you follow these videos, you know you've seen that. And Romans 9, I'm telling you, Romans 9 is no different. We haven't seen all this glorious truth uh, pertaining to the finished work of Christ and the sovereignty of God and God's choosing us and Romans 1 through 8 just to come into 9 and all of that change. Election is not foreign to the narrative is what I'm trying to say. Whereas many Christians just, they'll go to 9 and they'll, they'll think that it is and it's not. No chapter division. No chapter division. The same is seen in Peter's denial which is followed by let not your heart be troubled. John 14. We can't be separated from the love of God and neither can God's people, Israel. Because we are both children of promise. We're both elect. The same conflict between flesh and spirit that we saw in Romans chapter 7 is also apparent as it regards us and Israel. We see that when this passage drives us to look at Exodus 32 where that Moses came down off the mount and wanted to give himself in place of his people Israel. There's an amazing expression of God's willingness to sacrifice himself, which we know he did. We know he did. But what really took and set me back in my chair, folks, was Paul's opening statement that he wished himself accursed for the sake of his brethren. This is the Holy Spirit. An amazing expression of God's willingness to sacrifice Himself for the sake of the disobedient through Paul and Moses. I hope you, God, I, I hope you get that. None who are of the Arminian persu persuasion or, or who, who hold to the tenets of Arminianism, legalism, Self-effort, works, righteousness by works, you know, the list goes on and on. The error of Arminianism. No, they can't read the ninth chapter and be honest with the text. It's impossible. They can't. They can twist it, pervert it. They can try to make it say something other than what it says. But they can't. you cannot change the words in the text. And Rebecca's twins, we'll see, is a clear lesson that election is not according to the flesh. He didn't have to place twins in the womb. And most Christians, they don't have any problem at all with God choosing a nation. None whatsoever. In fact, most of the Christians I know would agree that God chose Israel. But when it comes to God choosing them, now, now there's a big problem. There shouldn't be. Romans chapters 9 and 10 are the strongest statement of the majesty, the sovereignty, the glory, and the purpose of our God any place in Scripture, in my opinion. Well, look, I love you all. I truly do. And I want to thank each and every one of you for all of your comments, your messages, your emails, your phone calls, your support, your prayers. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.